You are listening to the Marginalized Conflicts podcast series, a project of the Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies course at Colgate University in fall 2008. As a collective, we selected present and past conflicts which we feel are marginalized, either in our own study of history and politics or in dominant narratives of both. We aim to inform, surprise, shock, and inspire. I am Matt Miller, and today's podcast is about the Soviet-Afghan conflict and its severe consequences in creating the global climate we live in today. This conflict, once mainly unknown to an entire generation, has been thrust back into the public eye with the production of the motion picture Charlie Wilson's War, a nonfiction movie about Texas Congressman Charlie Wilson and his involvement with the covert U.S. intervention in the Soviet-Afghan War. Members of the 9-11 generation, as I will refer to the adolescents who were too young to comprehend the Soviet-Afghan conflict but old enough to remember the events of 9-11, remain for the most part unaware of the deep history of United States intervention in Afghanistan. While many people of this 9-11 generation attribute the current conflict in the Middle East to religious differences, the true beginnings of this conflict can be traced back to communism and the Soviet Union. Marxist ideals first appeared in Afghanistan during the 1960s with the establishment of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, more commonly referred to as the PDPA. In 1967, the PDPA split into two rivaling factions, the Kalk and the Parcham. This division caused a rift in the party that would affect the nature of Afghan government for two and a half decades. Communist ideals gained popularity in Afghanistan until April 27, 1978, when the Afghan army, led by the Kalk faction of the PDPA, overthrew the prime minister and appointed former Secretary of State and Kalk leader Nur Muhammad Taraki, president of the newly created People's Republic of Afghanistan. His second-in-command was Halfazullah Amin. The PDPA regime quickly initiated Soviet-style reforms that sought to uproot feudalism in the nation. These reforms were met with strong disapproval from the public. Sporadic rebellions appeared throughout the provinces. Understanding the importance of cooperation in achieving their communist goals, the PDPA quickly turned to the Soviet Union for military and financial aid. In May of 1918, Afghanistan signed an international peace agreement with the Soviet Union, creating an Afghan-Soviet alliance. By the end of 1978, Afghanistan requests for aid escalated from needing individual advisors to wanting entire military subunits from the Soviet army. Throughout this period of time, the PDPA struggled with rebellions and created the pul e charki prison to hold and execute rebel insurgents. From April 1978 until the Soviet invasion of December 1979, 27,000 rebel Afghans were executed at that prison. By spring 1979, Rebellious outbreaks of violence had occurred in 24 of 28 Afghan provinces. Though the rebel cause was given the unifying name Mujahideen Resistance, the resistance was anything but unified. Rather, the resistance took place as separate regional warlords commanded their independent rebel forces. Though each faction was under separate command, they all operated with the same goal in mind. Sabotage played a main role in the resistance as individual groups would disrupt pipelines, power lines, and destroy strategic government assemblies in their province. Sabotage worked to create a state of upheaval to distract the Soviet regime. Other nations soon caught wind of the rebel cause as well as the extent of Soviet interest in the state. The United States in particular became interested in the cause as they saw many similarities between the Soviet-Afghan conflict and the Vietnam War. Acting National Security Advisor Sprignu Brzezinski commented on the U.S. aid in an interview with Le Nouvel Avisateur by commenting, We didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability that they would. The secret operation, Cyclone, was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Soviets into the Afghan trap. The day the Soviets officially crossed the border, I wrote the president, We now have the opportunity of giving the Soviet Union its Vietnam. Though the United States' aid to the Mujahideen resistance was in reality much more complicated than presented in Charlie Wilson's war, the main goals of the characters were correct. Texas Congressman Charlie Wilson and his CIA contact, Gus Avrakotos, did play a major role in initiating the program that would later be known as Operation Cyclone. Operation Cyclone involved the discrete funneling of U.S. military and financial aid through Pakistan and Saudi Arabia to eventually aid the Mujahideen resistance. This program started under President Jimmy Carter, was increased with the efforts of President Ronald Reagan and his regime. Operation Cyclone also incorporated the training of Mujahideen soldiers in CIA tactics such as car bombing and assassinations. 
These tactics were taught to members of the Mujahideen resistance such as Osama bin Laden and can be seen in current tactics of al-Qaeda terrorist acts. By 1979, the Mujahideen resistance, with its discreet U.S. aid, had created a turmoil in Afghanistan that the Afghan government could no longer contain. When the Soviet Union realized that indirect aid would no longer be sufficient in defeating the rebel cause, they fell into the Afghan trap discussed by Zbigniew Brzezinski by invading Afghanistan. On December 7, 1979, the Soviet Union seized control of major government and military outposts. During this takeover, President Hafizullah Amin was executed and Barack Karmal, former Parcham leader, was appointed as new president. The Afghan trap, as Brignu Brzezinski so aptly described it, became problematic for the Soviets in the same way Vietnam plagued the United States. The invasion by the Soviets was meant to cause fear in the rebels so they would lay down, but as did the Viet Cong, the Mujahideen resistance was infuriated by the invasion and became more motivated to succeed. Third world conflicts are not wars in the way that the U.S. and Soviet saw war up to this point. The United States learned this from Vietnam, and the Soviet Union was about to learn this from Afghanistan. The two world wars, followed by the arms race that accompanied the Cold War, prepared both the Soviets and Americans for World War III, but put them at a great disadvantage for the actual conflicts they both were about to face. In his book, Afghan Communism and the Soviet Intervention, Henry S. Bradshaw describes the conflict as a strange war. He describes the conflict this way, because a third world conflict is vastly different from a large-scale war between nations. The Mujahideen resistance utilized aspects of this strange war paradigm, such as guerrilla warfare, to fight unsuspecting and far more powerful Soviets. Bradshaw discusses the effectiveness of guerrilla warfare when he says, In guerrilla warfare, an unacceptable resistance means that conventional army suffers defeat simply by failing to master the situation, even though it is not driven from the field. The Soviet Union never met the passion of the Mujahideen or mastered their tactics, and because of this, in April 1986, the Soviet Union began to transfer the military responsibilities back to the PDPA in preparation for their eventual withdrawal in May of 1988. The Soviets left in two waves after negotiating a ceasefire with the Mujahideen officials. The mass exodus of the Soviet Union left Afghanistan in a state of disarray, causing close to three years of civil war. When the smoke cleared and the Soviets had completely withdrawn, Afghanistan was decimated. One million citizens were killed and another two million were displaced. Irrigation systems vital to agricultural production in the arid climate were destroyed during Soviet air raids. Most importantly, the Afghan government was left in a state of disarray. The United States was masterful and crafty with their intervention in this conflict, but as if they had completely forgotten about the rise of Hitler out of the German ashes following World War I, they abandoned Afghanistan before Reconstruction. The United States' interests were with the Soviet Union, and with the Soviet Union out of the area and spiraling towards oblivion, the United States left Reconstruction in the hands of Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Though Pakistan prospered economically due to its involvement with Operation Cyclone, U.S. trade ships left port cities in a bad state of violence and addiction. This fact and the decimation of parts of the country due to millions of Afghan refugees stationed in Pakistan caused Pakistani officials to create a hasty agreement with Afghani warlords, giving them governmental control in return for the use of Afghani trade routes. This hasty reconstruction created a pathway that would lead to the Taliban presence that we saw in 2001. The Soviet-Afghan conflict is the piece of the puzzle that connects the Cold War era to the Middle Eastern conflict era that we live in today. As Brignew Brzezinski predicted, the Soviet-Afghan conflict was the USSR's Vietnam, and it was a large part in the death of the Soviet Union. With the conclusion of one era must come the birth of a new era, and the failures in reconstruction efforts of the United States, coupled with the acquisition of CIA tactics by key Mujahideen officials, acted to usher in this new war on terror that we deal with today. This series is made possible by a collaboration among Clarence Maybe, Raynar Deli, Rich Grant, Tyrell Habercorn, the Student Audio Assistants, and the members of Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University. The music is provided by Poddington Bear. Thank you very much. <laughs>